Hello, Max Wright here, and just uh, following up with a video I did last week, which was uh, titled, um, Is This the Reason the Bitcoin Price is Not Exploding Right Now? And the video was uh, kind of started a great debate about the different consensus algorithms floating around the crypto world. And uh, there were some really, really good responses. So thank you very much to everyone who joined in. I think it was about 300 different replies, most of which happened on the uh, Reddit forum, the Reddit Bitcoin page. And I just wanted to use this video to kind of synthesize that and just draw out some of the really, really good um, points that were raised. And so we'll just go ahead and do that now. I do want to make one quick preempt, by the way. Uh, I wasn't suggesting in any way, shape or form that Bitcoin is in trouble or Bitcoin is doomed or it's, it's not secure enough. I wasn't suggesting that at all. I'm a huge fan of Bitcoin. The vast majority of my crypto wealth is held in Bitcoin, not in altcoins. And uh, I was just pointing out that the, real, the, the purpose of the video was to create a discussion about the efficiency of the different um, algorithms. And I, I put forth the idea, well, the fact that uh, Bitcoin in 2014 is paying around $650 million for security and to run the system. And I just pointed out that perhaps there's systems out there or algorithms out there that could uh, get even more efficiency than that. So I'll run through a couple of the major um, points that people raised. Uh, that I can answer sort of quickly. And then at the end, there was some there was some really, really good ones that which were buried really deep and that they didn't get the love they deserved. I wanted to bring them out for everyone to uh, hopefully get more discussion on that. So just some of the quick ones already. Um, some, someone suggested, this, who cares if the Bitcoin price goes up? It's like, you just want the Bitcoin price to go up because you've got lots of Bitcoins and so there's that. No, it's absolutely really, really important for the Bitcoin price to go up for this reason. The, the supply is set at 21 million dollars, uh, 21 million coins. We can't increase the supply. So if we want to increase the market cap, the only way to do it is increase the price. Now, why do we care about a large market cap? Well, the answer is that Bitcoin can't fulfill its role of making a really big impact in, and replacing you know, large chunks of the fiat currency if it doesn't have a big enough market cap. If there's not enough liquidity floating around, it can't replace a number of different fiat functions. So it is really vital to um, the Bitcoin world. If it's really gonna do its job and shake up the world, it has to have a massive market cap in the order of two or three orders of magnitude bigger than it is already. So that means, uh, I mean, so there, there really is a strong incentive for us to get that market cap up. The other thing is that during price rallies, that's when the most number of new eyes come into Bitcoin and that's when it attracts the most amount of attention and that makes it grow even faster in terms of awareness and user, um, user adoption. So that, it is a really important thing and, and a worthwhile goal. It's not just to line my pockets, although that's not a terrible reason if you ask me. Now, uh, so something that obvious that came out of the, this is that look for a huge run up in the Bitcoin price in early 2016, because in the middle of 2016, that's when the next um, halving of rewards is gonna take place. The Bitcoin rewards will go down from 25 Bitcoins every 10 minutes or so, down to 12 and a half Bitcoins. That's going to, um, that, that will half the cost of, uh, that it takes to run the Bitcoin network, but that will almost immediately be fixed and maybe even preemptively fixed with a run up in the price to bring it back to where it was. So something to look forward to. Um, someone said that time will solve, uh, will solve our problems because after we halve and halve and halve and halve and halve, and you know, eventually in a century or so, we get to the point where Bitcoin is run in, uh, entirely off of transaction fees. And that is true, that will significantly help the, the current, um, what I'm calling a, an issue. That will significantly help the, because what that does, it takes away um, price fixing because that's pretty much always, always a problem. Anytime you fix a price, uh, that's when you generate problems. And it's those fixed um, methods of inflation every 10 minutes that is kind of causing um, a little bit of a, a challenge for Bitcoin at the moment. So when those kind of play out in kind of, and you know, the majority of that will play out within about sort of 20 years. So that will help significantly, but we, it still is not um, the most brilliant thing in terms of efficiency because all that money paying in transaction fees and the little bits of inflation left, that still doesn't um, assist us getting more decentralization. We, we know that we're trending towards um, centralization. And so the goal is to try and find a more efficient way to get decentralization. And yeah, when, when the inflation kind of um, expires, we're still gonna have that problem, so it's worthwhile investigating. Um, one of the other questions was uh, co past coin distributions. Like, well, if you didn't just, use, if without the pr proof of uh, work algorithm, how would we have distributed coins? You know, it, it wouldn't have been done fairly. And I was like, well, 
question of fear is kind of uh, a little bit moot. It's like, but first of all, Satoshi is believed to have like mined you know, the, almost almost half the coins in existence. Um, and I don't think that's unfair, by the way. This genius invented it, and it's an incredible gift to the world. And I have no qualms whatsoever with him being a Bitcoin billionaire. If he is, I hope he is. Um, so I don't think that's it's unfair, but I don't think it's a particularly fair way to do anything. The, the next the next conversation was uh, what about future coin distribution? Um, it's like, well, how do you get lots of coins into lots of people's hands without the without mining? And two, th two things I'd like to say about this. One is because mining is tending towards centralization, it's not doing a great job of distributing the coins. And two, what people are actually doing is they're basically buying coins by buying mining equipment and you know, paying for electricity in order to get coins. So what, they're what this was the equivalent of, it's basically as if you know, the Bitcoin airdrop was given to a handful of chip manufacturers and electricity companies. It's like, here, have some Bitcoin. And now everyone go and buy Bitcoin off of those people. There's nothing fair about that at all. They did nothing. Uh, and it's not particularly environmentally friendly either. So those kind of two, two comments I don't believe uh, has any weight, but feel free to uh, correct me. There was some confusion about the limitations of proof of stake also being the, a limitation of delegated proof of stake. And I just want to take that they're very, very different. So proof of stake does have the limitation that it does tend towards centralization as it scales. And the reason that is so is because the way proof of stake works is the larger your stake, the easier it is for you to mine blocks. Now what that means is in order to run a node, pay for the equipment, plug it in, pay for the electricity and do the mining constantly, you have to, there is some fixed cost associated with that. And if you have a small stake, the chances of you uh, getting the block reward is so small that it's not actually profitable for you to leave the, the mining rig on. And so what it means is that people with large stakes, they're incentivized to do it. Small stakes, they don't turn it on. So again, as uh, the system develops, it tends towards centralization. Delegated proof of stake is not like that. With delegated proof of stake, you have a predetermined level of decentralization up front. When you choose the coin, when you create the coin, uh, and it's all open source, of course, you can go and create another delegated proof of stake coin right now. Uh, you, when you do that, you choose the level of decentralization you want up front. In the case of BitShares X, they've chosen 101 delegates as that sweet spot of enough decentralization but small enough cost. Um, someone said, well, they, they asked the, the literal question, which was the heading of the video, which was, is this the reason the Bitcoin price is not going up? And they said, no, it's because of reasons X, Y, and Z. And of course, I agree with all of those two. There's lots of different factors in, in the price going up. You know, some people said, uh, yes, merchant adoption, user adoption, whales taking profits, all of that is perfectly valid. But again, the video is designed just to draw attention to the fact of the limitations of efficiency in uh, proof of work and uh, how we can improve that. Some people um, said that mining, uh, sorry, Bitcoin has value because of mining. It's just simply because it's expensive to create a Bitcoin, therefore it must be valuable. And that's not true. Bitcoin has value because it, is, it has utility and it is scarce. Um, that's going back to regression theorem in Austrian economics. But basically that's just two requirements for being uh, value. And the, the Bitcoin's um, utility is as a payment network. That's its utility. That's its value. And, uh, another person said, Max, you're trying to solve the unsolvable. Uh, look, however much reward Bitcoin is, uh, sorry, miners are given, that's how much they're going to spend to mine Bitcoin. That makes sense. If I had a, you know, a million and one dollars right here for auction, and I put it up for auction, you know, how much would you bid up the price to? The answer is it'd get bid it up to a million dollars. That way, you just got one, one free dollar, and that's true. You know, miners are going to spend as much money as they can to win the rewards. And your statement is true. It's an unsolvable problem in proof of work. But there is a way to separate decentralization choose a, a way to be have a decentralized network and encourage that with rewards that are different. So your statement is accurate for proof of work, but not other systems. And now I'd like to get into a couple of, um, these are the two specific ones that are really of note. Well, it's actually three, I think, yeah. So a gentleman called Apotamus, uh, and he said, here's what I got from the white paper on delegated proof of stake. Step one, transactions change votes. And that is true. If you want to change your vote for who the delegates are, you have to, you know, the number of votes you have is proportional to how much uh, coin you have. Hence, it's delegated proof of stake. In order to change a vote, what you need to do is actually do a transaction. And you can just send all the money to yourself. And that way, you, the network acknowledges that you've changed a vote. So votes are contained in transactions. That's true. Step, step two, votes determine delegates. This is absolutely true, which the 101 delegates with the most number of votes, they will have permission to uh, create blocks. And step three, delegates determine which transactions are included in the block. Absolutely true. So we seemingly have a, a circular problem here. If delegates can prohibit 
certain transactions from being included, i.e. the ones that are voting them out of office, then they simply won't include them in the transaction. So let's take a look at that. So if there's one or two or three or some number of um, a small a minority of um, bad delegates trying to prohibit transactions from being included, that's absolutely no threat at all. Because what happens is every one every 101 blocks, the 101 delegates are assigned in a random order which one is going to mine, and then they repeat that process every 101 blocks. If one or two or three uh, or a minority of de delegates choose to ignore a certain transactions from a block, the ones that are voting against them other delegates will just include them and there's no net benefit. All that happened is transaction times went from 10 seconds to 20 seconds or 30 seconds or something like this. So therefore, if the majority of, of uh, delegates are nefarious, then they can create the longest chain to, be, uh, to not include transactions that are against them and they cannot be voted out. Now that becomes a serious, serious problem for the cryptocurrency. Now, what we need to do here is we need to compare that against existing systems, so proof of stake and proof of work. I'm just going to work with proof of work now because it's, it's, what, it's Bitcoin and it's what we know and love. So in the instance of Bitcoin, if I wanted to attack Bitcoin, one thing that I could do is I could, I just think about, you know, nefarious government, infinite number of guns and hardware and whatever can use the power of the law to um, try and destroy something. So, okay, let's say I'm a nefarious government and what, if I'm trying to destroy Bitcoin, what am I going to do? Well, one option that I have is I can put a gun to the heads of the um, two or three biggest mining pools take over 51% of the hashing power, and I can try and do a double spend or destroy the network in that way. Now, it doesn't really achieve much because what happens is the people with the actual mining rigs, they can just you know, very quickly point those rigs to other mining pools or just mine straight to the, the network themselves. And that will, so what happens is the nefarious actor that the government in that instance didn't actually achieve anything. They caused a disruption to the network, but it certainly wasn't fatal to the network. Now the next thing a nefarious government could do if it wanted to attack the Bitcoin network is it could go and attack specific, um, the owners of the mining rigs uh, and, and do it that way. Now that would be a far more permanent solution, but we have a pro right now it's a, if Bitcoin is still very, very decentralized. But as I said in the previous video, we do expect in the, uh, the mining to tend towards centralization. We're expecting that in the next year or two, there'll be massive mining warehouses built and the concentration and centralization of mining will be significant. So perhaps by controlling 20, 30, 40 of these massive mining centers, uh, then the government could actually can take control of the hashing power. Now, they, be, beware, they don't have to take control. What they could do is they could just blow up, you know, use drones and whatever, just blow up a couple of mining centers, take over some of the other mining centers, and now you're in a situation where you have the vast majority of the, of the hashing power, or at the very least 51%, by taking control of these handful of things. Now, once again, I don't, I'm not trying to say that the, the sky is falling and this is actually going to happen to Bitcoin. I don't think that at all, right? Let's be clear about that. But what I'm saying is, what is the level of protection that Bitcoin has against that, right? And the answer is, in order to do that, the, the, basically the government would have to go and put a gun to the heads of 20, 30, 40 CEOs who own these mining factories to get whatever d d done that they have to get done, all right? Now let's take a look at delegated proof of stake. In order to do that, in taking over you know, one or two or corrupting one or two delegates yields absolutely no benefit whatsoever uh, because you, you can't actually do anything um, by, uh, as a single corrupted delegate, but you get kicked out almost immediately. So what they have to do is they have to go and put a gun to the heads of what, 51 delegates. Now that is a higher barrier entry to putting a gun to the heads of say 20 or 30 or 40 mining centers. Should Bitcoin get that, become that, decentral, uh, that centralized, which we, uh, I think it is tending towards. So the, now you come back to the cost of securing that system. It's like, well, delegated proof of stake, you had to put the gun to the heads of 51 people compared to 20, 30 or 40, and one cost about $5 million per year and the other cost about $650 million per year. Hence, the, the, the original premise of the video was that the delegated proof of stake system is significantly uh, better value for money in terms of crypto network security. Um, Penny Service has also said this kind of the same thing, but in a different way. And uh, if you go looking for the thing, it's, it's well worth reading um, his comments. And then I think the best comment of all, um, the one that I had not considered this in any way, shape or form. So thank you to, uh, this is on the Bitcoin Reddit forum by someone called Illogy, I-L-O-G-Y. I encourage you to go to look, find this thread and, and read it. It's longer than what I'm going to say here. I'm going to try and surmise it. But he said, the problem with purely software based consensus algorithms like delegated proof of stake is that they suffer from the very thing that gives them success, their efficiency. In contrast to proof of work algorithms, which always result in just a few coins surviving as coins compete over the same limited mining resources, 
proof of stake coins do not compete over the same mining resources or any mining res resources for that matter, making their proliferation potentially unlimited. This makes them ideal to be used for closed contexts like decentralized exchanges like BitShares X, uh, voting systems, um, the, a music sharing industry, lots of things, but less ideal as a universal currency. So Illogy, that's a really, really good point that I had not considered. It'll just elaborate for people. Um, what happens is, if I was to, if you'll notice now that you know no new altcoins are built on like SHA-256 anymore, because what would happen is these, these mining rigs that are dedicated to um, mining uh, Bitcoin, they could just point to a new coin without much mining resources behind it, literally blow it up, mine all the coins, you know, in, the, in like seconds, and then come back. And that would be the end of it, right? So it destroys it. That's where Litecoin came along. It came along with a script algorithm, and so that the big, you know, the ASIC brutes uh, of Bitcoin couldn't destroy them. But now we see there's ASICs in the script world, and now we see it's harder and harder for you know, new altcoins to become in that. So Illogy's point is absolutely valid that with the proof of stake systems, what they do is they tend towards one centralized um, uh, currency, cryptocurrency, because the others just kind of get blown away by the mining power. Contrary, delegated proof of stake, you have a defense mechanism to keep away people attacking the system. So a new um, coin can, could launch and all the mining power in the world can be over here mining this coin, but it can't attack this system because you don't have permission to be a miner in that one because of the delegated proof of stake system. Now what he's suggesting is, what that means is you can have lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of delegated proof of stake systems and you won't end up with a one universal currency. Brilliant, brilliant point. I had not considered it and it's perfectly valid. It raises the question, is it desirable to have one single currency, a universal currency? And I thought about that a lot. Uh, two things pop came into mind. One, there's a certain convenience factor to it. I, I totally get. Um, I've lived in places where you know they accept US dollars, they accept euros, and some stupid little local currency that you know, only the locals use. And it's that there's some level of annoyance to it. So there's some convenience to having a universal currency. I get that. Second thing I noticed is that most of us, we were born in a country where they just, the government told us what currency we were going to use. And so we got used to using one currency. But I think that's pretty much about it in terms of the, the, the benefits of and why, we'd, why we would want just one universal currency. Um, I think there's nothing wrong with the fact, uh, you, I mean, competition breeds excellence. So having a number of different currencies competing against each other, I think would actually be an improvement because those currencies would compete, there'd be constant innovation and they'd be you know, trying to build their market cap constantly. And so I think it's actually better to have multiple different currencies. And it's certainly what the, the market would choose, I would think, without a government saying, this is the currency, this is what you shall pay taxes in. I think um, a more, uh, the market would choose to actually have multiple currencies. And I think having something, because delegated proof of stake systems are actually profitable in and of themselves, they're basically like you know, digital companies. So I, th I don't think it would be weird. I don't think it would, be, it would harm the market or it would be bad for efficiencies if I went to you know, a grocery store and tried to buy something and the bill was denominated in like Apple stock, Amazon stock and Alibaba stock. It's not a bad thing. And if delegated proof of stake is more decentralized than Proof of, uh, proof of work, then imagine what a number of different delegated proof of stake systems, how much more decentralized that is compared to a single um, proof of work system. So I yeah, so that, that's a point for a really good debate. I hope lots of people comment on that. Is it better to have one, one universal currency or is it better to have a number of different currencies competing? Um, Please, uh, if you have, want to comment on that or any other part of this video, we'd love to further the discussion. Just go ahead and write the comments below and uh, I'll see you soon.